there is already a lot of mining happening in this country. And where do we need, you know, many more mining industries coming into the country? Uh, way back in 1987, uh, TN session when he was the MOE secretary, he had said that uh, the country produces aluminium uh, by only one mining project in Davanjuri in Orissa, which can sustain and fulfill the needs of the India, 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 you know, Indian people for the next hundred years. Now, Damanjodi aluminium project was established in the 80s. 84 and 85 it started, and between then and now, we have so many aluminium factories coming up, so many aluminium projects coming up. The FTA agreement components is, uh, no, there will be no limitation to export of minerals from the country. And uh, the history has shown us uh, that the, the, the mining that is taking place in this country has been more to export the minerals and it hasn't really, it hasn't helped the local community. It has actually destroyed the traditional economic base of the community. It has only benefited the neoliberal economic um, you know, agenda and the, and the, and the and actors. Uh, now, uh, what is happening on the ground? Uh, on the ground, there has been a lot of resistance, there has been a lot of opposition to the projects. It's not, it's not only the opposition to the project was per se. People are opposing because their territory is at danger. Their, their you know, very basic basis of life is in danger. The very basis of sustenance and um, identity is, in, is a threat. As people are resisting against the projects, as people are resisting against forceful acquisition of their land and resources, the state, the Indian state has become even more aggressive and repressive uh, because the state has facilitated, uh, facilitated the implementation of the projects in ever greater speed. And in Orissa, we have already lost more than, more than 20, uh, now it is 23 uh, members, you know, they have actually been killed by the police because they resisted and protested against such projects uh, because it was, you know, taking away their land. When we talk about mining, we also need to understand that it's not only mining that is taking place. In every part of the country, wherever there is a mining company or the mining project is being planned, there is always, the state has ensured adequate water and electricity resources. So. There are dams being built to generate, you know, uh, electricity to facilitate the projects to get enough water. Now the Prime Minister of India or the state, uh, the Indian state is very much concerned about the security threat and it say the Prime Minister himself has said that the Naxalites are the greatest threat to the country's security. Now I would like to, you know, uh, internal security, internal security uh, to the country. Um, I, I think we need to understand uh, that it will it will increase if we uh, if we you know do not take into consideration the kind of resource grab that is happening, the kind of you know decimation that is happening. So that kind of, now we are saying that this is the red corridor of the country, and it, it will be of no you know within no time the red corridor territory will increase. And FTA will be a sure shot to get into, you know, much more uh, violent um, reaction from the from the people. Um, in the last six six months to a year, we've seen a lot of these mining struggles, and I would say environmental struggles coming to the fore in the country. Um, and one of the concerns has been um, with this EU India free trade agreement that if this agreement had been in place already, um, whether these struggles would have had the success that we are seeing in that right now, or whether it would have even been a topic of discussion. And the one reason is that, um, as Shalmi pointed out, post the Lisbon Treaty, the European Union has started negotiating an investment chapter in the free trade agreement. This investment chapter basically acts as a bill of rights for companies. Um, and what it does is it holds the Indian government accountable to these companies in private arbitration settings. So it's not like these companies will challenge the Indian government actions in our courts, where our courts will look at the Indian constitution, look at local laws, and then make a determination. We will go to a private arbitration setting, where three private arbitrators will look only at this treaty and decide whether the Indian government has done right by European investors or not. And there are provisions called expropriation, which basically says that the Indian government cannot expropriate, nationalize, directly or indirectly, the investment of a European investor. 
If you do that, you can do it only in public interest. So let's assume that we can claim that what's happened with Vedanta is in the public interest, keeping environmental rights in mind, uh, tribal rights in mind, etc. The Indian government would have to pay fair market value as compensation, even if it did that. Which means that you completely change the Indian government's perception and accountability to its citizens because you are now matching with its accountability to European investors. And that completely changes, you know, as, as Mamta pointed out, whether the constitution is supreme any longer or you have uh, an investment or a trade treaty on the other side which is equally supreme. Um, Vedanta is a UK company. I think that's where the concern comes from that uh, would the Indian government actually have taken the step to protect the hills in Yangiri if the FDA had been in place, if the Treaty Agreement had been in place. So I just wanted to highlight where that concern is really coming from.